Hello and welcome to the February 2022 ENSO seminar. Uh, we are very lucky to be joined this month by uh, Sarah Rotrust Mundy from the Un also University and also from uh, recently and, and perhaps still in transition from the University of Southern Denmark. Uh, Sarah is a, um, a researcher whose work crosses a number of disciplinary boundaries and uh, so covering um, anthropology, psychology, uh, philosophy, cognitive science generally, and a kind of a, a wonderful example, I think, of that, uh, the, the, the virtue of interdisciplinarity when cognitive science is done well, but also, I think, done in such a way that uh, properly values human experience and sort of incorporating um, real world activity and, and real world endeavors in a way that is um, deeply valuable anyway. So um, Sarah was director of the Center for Human Activity, Interactive Interactivity in uh, the University of Southern Denmark. And as I say, is, is currently in a, in a transitional phase, a, a, a kind of a liminal space as the, uh, the we all are partly um, due to the remote nature of life at present, um, but also due to a, a transition to Oslo University. Um, so we will just give people a, a moment or two. I think we have a couple of people on live now and uh, we'll be able to begin our talk. This is um, something I'm very looking forward to. It's actually a nice um, unfolding of themes across the, uh, the, the few ENSO seminars that we're starting the, the year with. Um, with some uh, uh, nice um, themes connecting with uh, last month's and I think also um, as we will soon see next month's um, a kind of joining them around time and, and coordination and um, the, the sharing of, of places. Just before we get started with the, um, the presentation itself and the seminar, um, I will just share a bit of a kind of a, an announcement as it were, or a bit of news. Um, this is just to, to make people aware it might be interesting for um, some members of our community that a, a symposium uh, being where revisiting behavior setting theory will be taking place in Roskilde in uh, Denmark on the, the 25th and 26th of April 2022. Um, so that call for registration is currently out and has been extended. Um, and so you can see being-where.netify.app um, will be the, the, um, the, the address there to look for. You can, you can probably um, Google the, the link as well. And this is a, an exploration of and a revisiting of behavior setting theory. So the work of Roger Barker and his many colleagues, Louise Shed Barker, um, Herbert Wright and others, and the work of the, the Midwest Psychological Field Station. Uh, it's work that has sort of become increasingly more referred to over the last few years, thanks substantially to the efforts of Harry Heft and in sort of reintroducing it as a kind of almost a lost literature, I think, um, a lost body of work, which um, perhaps maybe hasn't had the impact that it deserves. And we'll see whether that managed to change it, but it um, proved or promises to be a, an interesting and, and hopefully um, discursive and fun symposium. And uh, something to look forward to as we increasingly open our doors and step out into, uh, in, into real places and, and wider worlds. Um, as, as restrictions lift. Okay, so we are, uh, I think we're probably at a, a good point where we might um, begin the, the process. So I will invite you, Sarah, to you might share your screen for your slides and present the uh, February 2022 ENSO seminar, Human Cognitive Pacemakers. Yeah, and you see that now? It, yes. Yeah. It's there? Okay, so. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the uh, for the introduction. I mean, uh, that was a really nice introduction, and uh, and I am going to talk about a, a vast um, or many different kind of uh, empirical settings, uh, and I am going to talk about human experience. Um, I think I'll say two things mainly in my talk, and one thing is uh, very. Um, uh, practical about pacemaking, and I will argue that pacemaking is key in all kind of cognitive work. And um, while there has been this huge focus on concepts such as time perception and lived temporality and human uh, life that is multiscalar and we are capable of transgressing 
time scale, so drawing on the past to anticipate the future, I'm more interested in the actual pace with which we do things. So the actual pace with which we act and perceive and what that really means in particular situations. And uh, the second thing I wanna talk about is more generally about the role and the, the function of qualitative work uh, in, in cognitive sciences and particularly the, um, the messiness and the emotional experience-based um, uh, processes and that kind of particularity. And I think that should have, again, a much bigger role than it has uh, currently in, in the sciences. So my background is in, in cognitive ethnography, if, if I should say something that it's in. And when I work as an ethnographer, I think that uh, we are getting further and further away from the subjects that we really want to talk about. So there's something there that is unsatisfactory in terms of the explanations that we get that are so basic and so general that they become sometimes almost flat or too formalistic uh, and functional in the attempt to explain human life at its core. Uh, so I think that we, we end up very often, uh, even if we don't want to, with these very uh, reductionist uh, explanations that, um, that we don't really tell the particular story about what that adaptation that we are talking about really is. So I think that the, the core mechanisms are really important and crucial. It's, it's not that I'm saying, but they must be treated as, as mere substrates or if you want a metaphor like the skeleton that kind of shapes uh, forms of life. So by that, I mean that we should find somehow better ways of integrating what's similar like the skeleton or the mechanisms with what diverges, which would be some sort of uh, personality or personalized standards, ways of doing things. And those two things are kind of what, you know, um, makes up my title of the talk, Human Cognitive Pacemaking Beyond Functionalist and Formalistic Analysis of Life. Um, so, yeah, um, <laughs> this is uh, a little uh, a little background of where I come from. Um, and it's, of course, relevant to talk about a starting point in terms of how can we grasp that kind of uh, life, both theoretically and empirically. And I grew up in the paradigm of, well, you name how many e-cognition, I call the 101 e-cognition here because um, it's, it's a scientific paradigm of which I'm very sympathetic. I mean, I, I basically live in that paradigm, but I think perhaps we need to push that in new directions. And perhaps we are at this point of repetition with repetition. Uh, my problem is not so much with the, with the number uh, of emerging terms that come along in the field, like enacted, embedded, and, and so on and so forth. And I know they're very different. It's more the fact that, that the language becomes so abstract, again, that these explanations seem to apply to all living organisms like bacteria, bonobos, humans. And it's not wrong. It's simply that uh, the cost for this extreme simplification, where you end up with these very few principles and mechanisms are, uh, that apply to all cases, well, that cost is exactly anonymity. So you have no idea of what it is that you're talking about. What would that person be like? So my concern, which I think I share mostly with many anthropologists and phenomenologists is not with the generalization of say, how cognition um, rely on a certain uh, set of interconnected mechanisms and their causal relations that allow us to talk about very usefully, I think, general doctors or a statistical reader. The problem is if it's kind of like um, the only game in town and, and it, it kind of reduces humanities to this engineering, um, uh, enterprise where there suddenly is no need for the humanities. And I think that's a, a, a problem. And I'm not alone on, on that kind of critique. I mean, almost 20 years ago, the neurophysiologist Alain Batot uh, anticipated this great revolution, as he called it, in how we approach man and life by moving beyond these formalistic approaches. And he said that what has happened in the last century, I think, is that we have been dominated in France in particular by an extremely formalist view of many activities. And there are many theories which have given a major role to the logical, cognitive and language driven knowledge and emotion has been forgotten. And of course, there has been many discoveries, including sophisticated results on cognitive decision making, etc. But in the last 10 years, approximately, emotion has been reexamined. And this is on our, uh, in our area, the sign of a great change, which is also happening in other areas. So there is something going on there where people are kind of acknowledging that these formalistic approaches um, are not the whole story at least. 
So while we're good at telling this um, skeleton story or the mechanism stories, if you want, with all our similarities, I mean, if you zoom out enough, we are uh, kind of similar. Uh, I want to emphasize how that with those shared biological capacities for agency, how is it then even possible for us to deviate to the extent that we do, even within the same domains and the same task settings? And in echoing um, John Stewart, the inactive cognitive scientist and, and process uh, biologist, he, he calls out and says that epistemology of the process of flow of life is crucial for its destiny in science. And he says that from the moment that one understands the physical chemical mechanisms which account for the properties of living beings, life evaporates. Today, a molecular biologist has no use in his work for the word life. Um, so John Stewart did emphasize that there has been a need for breathing life back into biology. That was, I think, his title, the main title of his recent 2019 book. Um, so, I mean, many people, many scientists have produced this kind of negative argument that what we're doing is not a good enough job uh, because they're a crucial part of the story of human life that we leave out. So I think that will be my starting point. Um, and I think that one way to build the more positive argument starts with simply telling the story of how humans use different tricks, or do different strategies to achieve um, similar results, but also uh, new outcomes. So something I think that we have been neglected for a, a long time or haven't even focused upon perhaps are exactly these tricks and the strategies people use. And that's exactly um, the processes. I mean, that's the stuff in between a problem and the results uh, or the outcome. And I think that all that in between is really the cool and also the messy uh, underexplored stuff that needs currently at least an empirical basis because whatever happens there is completely impossible to predict. Uh, and, I, and I really mean that seriously. So we need these particular stories uh, of how the creative unfolds in different ways. And formalism seems to block for this um, alternative view uh, that highlight change and diversity. So a more experientially grounded approach um, will also allow us to ask different kinds of questions. I mean, rather than saying, what is an expert doctor or what is a good student? You can ask questions such as, um, how can we within cultural niches be different kinds of students, different kind of doctors? And how is it that it's possible for us to exploit those substrate in ways that allow us to come up with new ideas and also apply different strategies? So the scientific question here is, of course, how can we tell a story that is relevant enough for the community, but does not become so abstract that it says nothing particular about the event? And to say that differently, how can we conceptualize particularity of human life? And if so, what is it? Um, and of course, I'm not the only one who points to these uh, challenges. I mean, many people have looked very carefully at the variety of settings and practices and identified what some would call a human exceptionalism in terms of our extreme multimodal dexterity. That is that we are so good at very timely and smoothly to coordinate, for instance, um, the adaptive behaviors when we sue, when we're making art, when we are detecting uh, sound, uh, Paul Thibault would call that a picoscale uh, varieties in sound, both when we produce that, but also when we perceive it. And also how we can control speed of action perception by manipulating movement, which is what I would call the pacemaking capabilities. So I think that there are many that have shown uh, the richness of this kind of material engagement, engagement to use Malaforis's terms with the world at hand or the world at sight. I mean, the empirical world that we can perceive at least. And I'll emphasize how this is important in the light of pacemaking, but I'll also try to show how pacemaking is used to engage with the world that is not at hand or not at sight. I mean, the things that doesn't really have this material, uh, uh, the, the, the strong coupling with the environment. So uh, first I, I will show a case of how an extreme pacemaking control is used in professional dance. The data here are um, from a project which is conducted by David Kirsch in San Diego. And I worked with these data in his lab in 2012. Uh, and this particular example here is analyzed and co-authored with uh, Matthew Harvey. And the clip is um, 24 seconds. And we focus us here on a professional dance choreographer in the front in the black clothes here. Um, and he is instructing a particular movement in a small dance sequence. So there's one step of interest, which is moving his left leg 
down to the floor, there's a problem with that particular step. And the dancers are professional dancers from the London Ballet. And within these 24 seconds, uh, he dances the small sequence three times in a row. Uh, but each time his pacemaking changes. And, and please notice here how he uses vocalizations, like first words, then just sound, to couple these acoustic dynamics to the dynamics of the dancer's bodily movements as she shows the steps. So that, as he do that, uh, as he does that, uh, it enables the dancers to coordinate their um, their intra uh, bodily uh, movements or dynamics of their own simultaneous dancing. So I'm just going to play the clip here twice um, before explaining in more detail what happens. But it's three uh, cycles in a row where the final step is the left uh, leg moving down to the floor. <laughs> So, I mean, so many things uh, go on there that it's, um, that it's a really, really, really cool example. But, but one thing we want to focus on here, I want to focus on here, is the vocalizations and the differences in, in pace. So one way to demonstrate how um, the end result or the step here is approached by controlling pacemaking uh, relates to his use of these vocalizations, the things that he says here. And, and his first vocalization is, um, is word-like. So he uses the word slow down in the foot. Uh, so slow down to the floor uh, and the two following are meaningless in, in, in a linguistic sense so at least they carry different kinds of meaning that are more um, ineffable or unconstrained by this kind of semantic knowledge so you can you can hear how his song line uh, pitch goes from high which is 313 hertz to low which is 260 hertz you can hear the differences uh, here slow Right, so our hypothesis is that he's not showing the perfect step, rather he kind of emphasizes aspects of that step that the dancers show him that they don't get. So his different cycles kind of reflect his perception of the dancers' movements as either too high or too low, too fast or too slow. And it's, it's interesting that these claims are, I mean, we talked, uh, or we didn't, but those who conducted the study talked to uh, the choreographer and another choreographer too. And they, uh, they talk about choreographer's role as in, in very uh, interesting ways. So the first one says that the art of dancing is, is as much moving it's, uh, as it is knowing the effect a movement sequence has on the observer. It is knowing where to put an accent, which phrase to emphasize, when to accelerate or when to release. Most of this knowledge is impl uh, implicit. It encompasses the principles of perception and motor control and what is summed up by experience, the product of years of training. And our own choreographer says, in terms of when he's using what they call sonification, these kind of vocal uh, wordless, very often uh, utterances. I wanted this energy of high and low, but uh, it wasn't about just about a spatial organization for me. It was about a feeling of moving and it was from the inside out rather than the outside in. I felt that sound wise, I needed a layer of information that wasn't about words and wasn't about interpretation of words. I could sing them a rhythm that would help them express the physicality so I could express what the transition sounded like to give them a kind of an embodied image of it. So I think that's really, really cool how you can actually do things very differently because you are so um, capable of adapting to what happens in your environment. So you actually can see and detect if you have that kind of control and knowledge within the domain of the task, uh, you can easily pick up on that. So you can adjust and emphasize different aspects of the steps in this case. 
But if we then move from this case of um, experts with an extreme pacemaking control and now focus on how some psychopathologies at least relate to the inability to, um, to constrain this uh, pacemaking or, uh, or control the pacemaking, uh, I think that in the case of psychotherapy, very much of the work has to do with this temporal regulation uh, of the interaction, which of course then affect the emotional regulation too. And um, well, the idea is that this kind of you know, temporal regulation is often more crucial than the content of which they speak or talk. Uh, and in one study of uh, the psychotherapy project, which was led by Stephenson and Jensen, we observed that for some patients, uh, pacemaking does not afford anything. I mean, it, it remains a rather subconscious pacemaking that either uh, allow or enable them to escape places that actually needs attention, or in the contrary case, it, it, um, it holds them or fixate them in places where they actually have to move on from. So the patient's uh, difficulties in controlling their pacemaking and, and, and having power over how they pacemake is managed very often by the psychotherapist who then uses um, the patient's pacemaking to carve out relevant aspects of attention. And of course, the idea is that over time, uh, the patients have to learn and, and to anticipate these pacemaking constraints. I mean, now I'm going into a, a phase where it's not good. I need to regulate that. Uh, and they have to be capable of um, using that knowledge to do something uh, in their behavior that um, allow them to regulate that emotional um, dysfunction, so to speak. Um, so my former colleague, Johanna Phillips and I started to observe the frequency of these pace, uh, regu pacemaking regulations uh, in psychotherapy. And in particular, we observed that there was one uh, psychotherapist who was really, really uh, explicit about the pacemaking in, in the therapy sessions. And she would actually address that uh, directly and seem to have a, a, a really, really good effect. Uh, so in this first example, there is a patient here and she is uh, in her 13th um, therapy session. She's diagnosed with um, anxiety and uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. And they have within the therapy, they have been training breathing techniques uh, as a way to get power over or to regulate the emotional states. And here the patient has been in, in this state where she's like frustrated and she speaks faster. So her temporal uh, pace uh, really changes uh, in accordance with her emotional uh, states too. So the therapist here goes in and says, so it's going a bit fast now, I feel. Yes, that's because, and then some kind of, you know, uh, nonsense response. And then she overlaps again, the therapist says, can you also feel that? Yes. Um, what's happening in your body right now? Not really a response. And as she says that she has this in your body right now, the gesture that kind of, you know, indicates there's something going on that's not uh, functional, useful. Uh, I felt I got a little out of, uh, I got a bit out of breath, she then says, and the patient here confirms. So you, you see how the therapist's role here is to highlight with a uh, term Goodwin uh, uses in his professional vision paper from uh, 94. It's like she highlights the cues that the patient needs to be able to pick up and respond to and over time manage herself, but doesn't in this particular situation. And there's a, a slightly different example here, I think is, is really um, good too, because in an earlier session, it's the same patient, it's in her ninth session of therapy. Uh, the therapist helps the patient with perceiving this kind of emotional dysfunctional state. So she's doing, the, the therapist is kind of doing the perceptual work, but compared to, um, to the previous example here, the patient is suddenly capable of acting on that, uh, on that perception and herself regulate uh, her emotional stance. So the patient, I mean, what comes just before here is that the patient has just told the therapist that she was surprised and kind of intimidated by uh, her supervisor's behavior in relation to a new job she just got. Uh, and the patient told that, uh, that that kind of supervision made her insecure. And you see here in line 18 that the, the therapist seeks more information about that insecureness. And then the patient starts explaining that she did not like feeling being watched and checked. However, uh, what happens then is that after a short time of this kind of explanation, the patient ends with taking a breath in before she then concludes that she took a deep breath. And you can see that here. So she's 
like as she's doing it, taking the deep breath, she's explaining that what she did to regulate that kind of, you know, emotional distress, she took a deep breath. And it's, it's uh, nice because the patient here recognizes the right place for using the breathing tool that she has learned. And she actually acts upon that identification that the therapist pointed, uh, hinted at. So as the patient here breathes in and out, the therapist uh, not just simulates, but she also prolongs that. So she actually does it together with her saying, and then she completely exaggerate and overdoes it like, so she's really emphasizing that this is a kind of important moment. And she's also extending that moment and smiles to kind of confirm or sanction that the patient is taking control over the pacemaking and regulates her emotion here. So I think that um, the, 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 the things that we see is that the therapist kind of directs the patient's attention to the pacemaking by highlighting rhythm over the content. She's rarely talking about the explanations here, but more about the rhythm and the pace with which she engaged and what happens in her body, the kind of you know, emotional responses there. So she uses pacemaking control so that the, the problematic places endure also. Uh, and the patient, oh, I don't know if you see that. Oh, so, um, and the, uh, because the patient is part of that interaction, she feels that emotional uh, effect that that pacemaking change has too, which eventually, or hopefully at least, would lead to the patient's uh, ability to perform the same kind of control. So the um, then I took a deep breath is an example here of the patient's uh, ability to actually calibrate her emotional stance herself. So, um, so we've just seen some examples of how humans can pacemake uh, to regulate agency in accordance with changes in the environment. Uh, and I think that humans might have an extreme multimodal dexterity um, skill so that we are able to see these extreme cases of coordinative behavior. But it, it actually also happens in the animal kingdom to, to a large extent, right? That there is this ex extremely strong coupling with aspects of the environment. Um, at hand. So I think what's crucial here is that while that's fascinating in itself, I think that humans pacemake in other ways too. Uh, from some of the observations that we did in our reading data, um, we, we identified that people very often uh, disengaged. So uh, they were acting in what could be defined as very irrational ways according to the standard view of, of what reading is a, a kind of a task at least. And we saw these kind of disengagement in the, the attentional shifts uh, where people would kind of freeze. Uh, they would somehow try to decouple themselves from the material boundedness, uh, the, the actual situation where they're reading. And then I was really surprised when I viewed your um, previous Enso talk by the Japanese philosopher Kono, because I was really sure that these moments that we identify could be explained exactly by the, the concept of sinuhima that he introduced. Um, and just to give a little context, that concept he explains come from the Japanese no theater and an extremely fascinating cultural performance, I think. And it means this empty time where one does nothing. And it refers very specifically to a situation uh, where the actors on stage uh, pause to create this kind of ability for a shared mind. And it's been characterized, he mentioned, as one of the most interesting places uh, in the performance because the audience has to bridge this gap between the past and the future uh, where everything becomes possible. Uh, and when you think about it, it's, it's really fascinating. When you are in flow, um, the next step is almost uh, predicted or anticipated. And when you break that flow, the trajectory is completely broken and the path is much less obvious and you can actually do almost everything. Uh, so it's a process that I believe um, correlate with prefaces of uh, eureka moments or more creative imaginative processes where a person suddenly sees a new sol a solution to a problem. And that can happen because you're in a state where you kind of, um, if, you, if you freeze and does not fixate on the problem, you're uh, putting yourself in a position where you allow ideas to float and percolate uh, without having the prefrontal cortex editing everything out uh, that doesn't really help to your fixed problem solving case. You know, you're not just uh, reducing every noise uh, in the activity. And empirically, 
it has been shown to correlate with behavioral changes such as facing away. So you can see the visual area stem. You have people uh, look up and away from the actual challenge in which they are embedded, trying to decouple from that kind of materiality that is there. So there are these moments, I think, where people are trying to make it all come together when they're focusing uh, without, I would say, focusing on the problem at hand which we saw before, the, the strong coupling. And I think um, in another previous ENSO talk, or that was actually an interview with the anthropologist Mingle, uh, he says that humans are strange because we have a kind of imagination that is always there shooting off in the distance and a material engagement that is always holding us back. And this is a particular tension that humans experience. Any artist will agree on that. Imagine you're a composer and the music is shooting ahead in your imagination. And you're struggling with this pen and paper, trying to notate it down on the manuscript paper. So that's the actual materiality. And the really hard work of composition, composition is holding it there, the imagination, so you can get it down. That's what I think the freezing moments are so crucial. You're really trying to not lose it. And there's a constant anxiety that it will all going to slip away from you before you manage to catch it. And I think that is really the root of human life, the imagination. And actually you see that empirically here, right? They're literally trying to hold on to an idea or they're gazing up and away. They can't have the problem they're trying to solve, distract them. So they need somehow to decouple from that particular environment. So I started to see these kind of uh, Sinuhima moments or at least pacemaking moments everywhere. And I was fascinated by the fact that they all the time during reading disengage. I mean, we would expect that people would somehow systematically engage with the task or leave it completely. But there were this in and out, you know, um, decoupling going on. And I think this tension between the new possibility space and also the constraint of the social material world that can hold us back, as, as Ingel said, is key. I mean, we see again here how the animal is uh, in a functional and, and coupled engagement, whereas the reader looks up and stares into nothing. So there's a, a very, very different aspect in the way that we try to do something beyond the analytical problem solving uh, that goes on. And so we, are, we were looking at um, so many, many, many different uh, cases here of reading. And we were, of course, interested in the, the places where people were uh, um, self-initiating these kind of breaks where it wasn't about external disturbances. And they happened all over the place, you know, with young children and uh, professional uh, or expert readers in, at the university. And just to give you one example here, of such a process. It's a male university reader who's studying and you see how he uh, his gestures here are, are quite uh, significant, right? He knocks him uh, himself on the forehead with his fist and he's pointing with his index finger. And there's definitely something there. He bites his lips and so on. And you see here the decoupling uh, that also uh, happens. <clears throat> so the frustration that occurred previously leads to this gazing up and doing nothing for a moment. Uh, and of course, we do not know exactly what happens there, but we expect that some kind of cognitive work must be going on, right? I mean, often these breaks also seem to be valuable to the reader. So you see this kind of smiling or, or that kind of gesture that you, you give you that kind of joy, which Eureka moments often give you. That's the benefit of that. Uh, interestingly, I mean, from the diary data, I mean, the data they fill in just after their reading, um, nothing significantly was reported. I mean, we asked, uh, so what's the purpose of the reading? Well, that was to fulfill the expectation written in the curriculum and get a thorough understanding of chapter five. So was there anything uh, of importance, you know, whatever that could be? No, nah, there was nothing uh, at all. Nothing was more important than the other. And you definitely see in his reading trajectory that there are definitely peaks emotionally. We also have uh, physiological measures and you can see that too. Um, so that's why we need, of course, to explore first person experiences in situations uh, and engaging in what they, what they do when it happens. And I think it's fascinating that um, no one at all has studied breaks uh, in reading. I mean, many has focused on the flow and many have focused on how specific word kind of prompts attention. But very often uh, those studies use, um, they would use eye tracking, uh, for instance, to see how the text constrain uh, reading or they will use uh, phenomenological reports to explore immersion, absorption, and so on. But as you see right before, it doesn't really give you much about the actual empirical breaks that are so subtle 
I think these kind of Sinohima moments are often unnoticed by the reader, even though they are so valuable to them. Uh, and second, they might have been ignored simply because they are wrongly assumed to be meaningless uh, or some kind of, you know, that's breaking with the task. It's another thing. People are not reading when they disengage from, you know, the ocular scanning on the page, for instance, which is completely, I think, um, well, you're losing a, a big part of the story if that's the way it goes. So uh, to almost um, um, coming to an end now, I think that what many researchers are starting to work towards now is a more dynamic understanding of cognitive processes, taking in the emotional aspect and the uh, experience of, of people who are doing things. And these first and third person perspectives are also often used, I think, to describe that uh, exact tension between the functional analysis of behavior and also its experiential backbone. So, um, Hutchins distributed cognition framework is also currently being uh, developed to span more than just functional problem solving and these task-based analysis. And I think that uh, to refer to the quote here that for a long time we have dreamt of in our psychology at least, specific uh, efficient ways in which humans engage with tasks. And in cognitive psychology, we have been judging the individual as this kind of functional being a, a variant of this economic uh, and tool using man with goal seeking and purposeful behavior. And we have dreamt less of uh, the ludic human and in, in here we're using a reference to Johan Heusinger's work. And he critiques this kind of, um, well, very one-sided logical and rational voices from the 18th century that shape specific scientific models. And he kind of flips the story around. So he grounds human culture in the playful imaginative mind of human and not the other way around saying that culture encourages playful behavior. I think that's important. So by kind of adding that ludic dimension, we have a richer account, I think, of how situations are managed by using a mix of both functional and ludic or imaginative creative strategies so because the situation is uh, an extended temporal frame in which we can do many things uh, and end up still at the same end point, uh, I mean, you can see someone who is acting in more analytical or predictable ways where the others take detours or act also without purpose or meaning, uh, but simply exploit the fact that they can decide because they are bored or curious or in uh, Emanuele Badone's terms, we are chance seekers. So it's far from everything that we do, even if we engage in these functional task uh, performances that are closely related to the goal. I mean, often you can see how people do things um, and they have no explanation for why they did it. Uh, we can also see that they will try to do things, even they predict that they will fail. So it seems that we are not always driven by moving forward or creating things, but we simply do things and we are, even if we are prone to fail. Uh, and I think we kind of lose that part of the story. So most importantly, um, I think we do not just pick up information. I mean, we make information from the engagement with the messy and the immediate meaningless environment in which we are embedded too. So a last example, that's my last slide now. Uh, I think that kind of summarizes that whole thing is to give you a, an example where we observed a reader who um, used a, a mix of reading aloud and reading more silently. And when we asked her why she did that, she was reading Faust in German and she is uh, a native, uh, her mother tongue is Danish. Um, and these, I mean, these reading aloud and reading so silently are very different kind of pacemaking um, uh, trajectories or, and also in terms of their experiential qualities. Um, and then she responded in two different ways. She said first, I do it because it's another language. The fact that I hear it, the case that it's not just a voice inside my head, but I actually also hear it allows me to focus my attention, that my thoughts, so to speak, are moved in the background. But I could also do it in Danish because I like multiple to use multiple senses in some way to well, then that's the only thing I need to focus on. And I'm not going to remember what I'll be doing tomorrow, which I often do when I read inside my head. So that's the, uh, the very functional aspect, right? That it has this kind of quality that she likes too. But she also says, I think German is awesome. I enjoy speaking it. So therefore it also, it's just cool, I think, to read it out loud and to hear it and at the same time feel it in the mouth, how the words kind of feel. So in that sense, reading with a purpose, um, this is her study material, right? Um, 
that's there, but she also reads in ways that are less efficient. I mean, it takes much longer time to read aloud than it does to read silently. And she's not necessarily doing it because it gives her a rich understanding of the content. It might do, but it's not the reason for her doing it. So I think I would rather say that the functional and the aesthetic are intertwined. They're completely impossible to separate and producing music through reading aloud here as she does, it's not just this auditory cheesecake to give a little critique to the Pinker uh, statement. The aesthetic and the functional are exactly inseparable aspects. Um, so that's it. And I wanna thank some of my, uh, as you see here, well, gesturing friends <laughs> They are. Uh, <laughs> They have been inspiring me in, in very uh, in very different ways. So they are uh, just as much responsible for what I'm saying here today as I am. I think. Um, that's wonderful, Sarah. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I love it. There's, there's, there's a, a sort of great richness um, here to mine, and um, plenty to talk about. I think there it, it also brings up a kind of a number of. Um, issues that are as you kind of you've picked up on this kind of um multi-scale dynamics is something that i think we're seeing pop up as a theme in um uh, sort of more frequently uh, in the particularly in the past few years and it, it'll be sort of really interesting to see as a community how we can start to properly tease it out um and just some lovely um clear examples that you've got here um, that I think offer a lot of, of opportunities. So thank you very much um, for that talk. So I'm gonna keep an eye on, we have a, a few people watching on the, the playback here. So I'll keep an eye on the, the, um, the chat window there for comments. But in the meantime, I get to ask my questions, which I am really more interested in, let's face it. So, um, I mean, I did, I just for partly, I just also kind of want to, um, uh, to sort of fanboy as it were to say thanks. There, there was some lovely illustrations that you had, and particularly early on, um, the when you talked about the um, the challenge of moving between formalisms and particularities, mm -hmm. and there was a kind of just a, a nice way that you are articulating things there that really struck me, and and felt very um, important, which is that tension that we have as scientists really I think where the you know when there is this notion that we develop a universal uh, understanding of the phenomenon in which we're interested in but the the limitations and it's a you know it's a an unavoidable limitation of formalism that the individuality becomes meaningless mess uh, that you know there's no way to add individuality to formalism except through some random and of course for human for humanity it's the individuality is the most meaningful bit you know it, it's trying to abstract away from it is precisely when we start to lose ourselves and um to see that articulated the way you did i, I don't i don't know it really it spoke to me I, I um i was kind of drawn in if i might just ask though a um one just clarificatory question which had to do with the uh, pacemaking in this in psychotherapy in particular so the, the, i love the choreograph example um and there's aspects of that i think we might like to get back, um, back onto but the, the the in when you talked about the pacemaking in the psychotherapy um were there particular aspects of pace that you were um, referring to because the the pacemaking tended to be of a kind of a slow down um you know deep breath has it mostly just to do with the, the speed at which a person is speaking, or are there are other aspects to the relationship or other aspects to the, the interaction that can yeah. be seen to be moving too quickly or moving too slowly? Absolutely, I think it's, um, so you can't say that there's one like the default pace and if we just manage that, then everything will be good. I think what the therapist picks up on are the changes. So um, suddenly the patient is talking about something in the story and then she's really, really frustrated because she's, and then she starts, you know, in the, the crease, uh, increases the, the pace of speak. And then she reacts to that. It's also, as I mentioned that, you know, sometimes they're trapped and fixated and they're like, can't even finish a sentence because they get like drawn into a fixation of something they have to move beyond that and sometimes they just talk to get them beyond the point so they actually literally would talk about this place that's difficult how do you move beyond that 
And you can also see that we wrote an article also about the gesturing, how the gestures kind of extend something that's problematic uh, and how you can reuse gestures and change your gesturing to talk about something. Uh, so it's, it's about the whole uh, interaction. And I think it's basically, um, it's again with the multimodal dexterity thing, it's like the whole body in all its, you know, with all the resources that, that comes with that body and, and the way that we uh, do things. And we, there's no like, uh, not one level that's good. It's simply about the changes. And of course, something just happens randomly, uh, but it's very often um, uh, related to or correlate with these emotional regulations too, right? That when you're excited, you will get, you know, or when you're depressed, you will, or frustrated. So I think there's something there about the emotional distress or basically the emotional responses. And that's also why she couples what happens to the bodily, like the gesturing in terms of some, something happens or changes in the body too. Mm that correlates with the pace more generally. So it's not just the, the, the voice, um, it's actually the whole thing. So it's the changes. I mean, why suddenly change? There must be something, you know, that kind of triggers the, the, the change in pace hmm. that has to be grounded in something more uh, problematic, in some sort of emotional um, uh, process. So it's, it's a kind of a lovely sensitivity to the more than literal aspects of the interaction you know I guess we it, you know it would be easy to get caught up in well what is this person saying in, in terms of exactly. as we might do with a you know if we're taking as you say an, an engineering approach to it mm -hmm. where it just yeah. becomes well we produce the transcript and then what do the words in the transcript say whereas yeah. in fact the conversation the, the words are only just that one aspect of it and and so the therapist is responsive in a holistic fashion rather than um, just in this purely transcriptive manner. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, 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 I mean, I mean, just to expand a little bit upon that, because I think it's it's key that, um, of course, it matters what we say, but sometimes it. Re I mean, I was surprised that it matters so little, very often. And and this therapist is also very particular, good at identifying these changes in the interaction. But very often she completely ignored the, the rational explanations why, I mean, she didn't care that it was because she looked over, she was more interested in how did you respond to that? Because if you can regulate that kind of responses, then you can solve all kinds of problems. It's not like these sentences make you feel depressed or something like that. So it's much more, well, what did you do when you felt insecure? I don't care what the, whether she was right or wrong or whether she was allowed to look over your shoulders or anything. I'm more interested in how you manage that. And so it's it's about these coping mechanisms and trying to control the emotional responses that they very often, you know, are the, the dysfunctional or the, that relates to the pathologies um, very specifically. Yeah, I mean, it, for me, it's a very striking, I mean, it's just, it's just a fascinating phenomenon in and of itself, but it also, um, to me, is kind of a, a striking rebuke of uh, I guess <clears throat> traditional computational cognitive science, and I, 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 I don't want to derail our conversation because I'd much, I'd much prefer to stay. But I, I think it's kind of worth noting that it has a, you know, the representationalist approaches. Essentially, you know, the meaning has to be in the representation, and how you make meaning is by making more representation. And there's a kind of a nice characteristic once you look at the. Well, actually, it's you know the the dynamic matters more than the. The particular utterance or articulation mm -hmm. um, is a kind of a you know adding more representation here doesn't help no. it, what what matters is really the genuinely bodily interaction between these two people and yeah. verbal is is part of that interaction but the the meaning of it is um you know you're not going to capture it by trying to write it down and nor is any brain going to capture it by trying to to you know depict it in some manner um, exactly so yeah. Um, so the, I, what that then, I guess the, the kind of the management of changes is something then that, um, you know, you, you, when you brought up the, the examples of reading and it's a lovely, again, it was kind of, obviously I read day in, day out, but I, um, and of course, when you say it, it was like, well, obviously we stop. And, but you never think about it in those terms. I mean, I, I know, you know, the, the window beside me that's where I go when I've hit something hard or when something's knocked me and mm -hmm. I go, oh crap. And I'll, I'll look out a window for a bit or, um, you know, we, we probably all have these when we, if particularly have, if we have reading places, we probably have particular habits. 
and thinking of it in terms as a pace management or a kind of a tempo management thing is is not something that would ever have crossed my mind before um but the the kind of so i guess it's it but what it found it interesting is it kind of almost um there was it wasn't not, not quite attention but there's an interesting um interaction then with ingold's statement mm -hmm. where the for ingold the way he described it at least in that case was the material was the means by which you slowed yourself down or you know it, it, it was kind of it was the things you're ultimately going to have to coordinate with whereas in this case it um it's never it, the you know the disengagement with the um the text was an engagement with something else it wasn't a it wasn't a purely disengagement um but it, it was a kind of well i'm, I'm going to look at something else now for a bit it was sort of a a movement to somewhere else or something else um yeah. was there ever a um what i found really interesting actually was one of the examples i don't know if you have of the your um your academic reader who moved from the book to the screen and back again was there kind of a dialogue going on there or was was the disengagement always just a is a way the only thing that mattered or is there where they went um yeah did that matter so so that's i mean that's one of the things i mean i i don't know because um we just started to look for these uh, incidents and they just happen everywhere what is kind of uh i mean so in the academic reading of course they are driven by some sort of you know they have to solve something but and and that's even more interesting i think because then sometimes you see how they're i mean so there are two things first of all there's this whole idea that reading is about fluency and being in flow and that we have to to you know we don't have to be distracted you know by things and you will see how in children's uh, lear children learning to read that they will be focused focused and it will be an unfocused thing if they disengage from the text so that's one thing i think first of all there we see that children are really i have uh, examples of that too they're really good at doing this kind of disengagement and then engage with the story so it's somehow related but to build on you know based on their own experience there's a, a child a boy reading the the giant fantastic pair i can't remember the title um, and he, he reads and you can see how his reading becomes more and more impaired when he is starting this kind of there's something interesting going on. And they will assess that as, you know, poor reading that now focus and concentrate. And what he's doing is just that he's playing with there's a thought starting to be built up somehow. And then he would, you know, disengage from the text and say, oh, I would love to live there in an edible pear. Imagine you can just eat from a pear and you can live in that every day. I mean, that's amazing. And then you see for two seconds, he's just the Sinuhima moment and then he kind of self-corrects himself because they learn to focus and then he goes back and what we see in the expert readers are that some and I have some beautiful quotes where they say I just have to notate everything and write everything down and I get so you know taken away by things but I have to focus so that kind of social normativity kind of constrain their imaginative freedom when they read so I think that we want to um, to test, can we kind of somehow manipulate the reading flow? Can we have people make more breaks? Because obviously, if people are just sitting there, they have to do something. And, and it seems so valuable when they do self-initiate these kind of breaks. So very, I mean, I don't know yet. I think there are many kinds and many degrees in which these breaks uh, function. So sometimes they're like, okay, I know there's information here. I need to find it in the, in the book. I've written something earlier in my computer in the case that you refer to here. Whereas sometimes it's just like, that's, um, that's interesting. Can you imagine living in a pair and then just, you know, moving along? It's not like mind wandering because it's somehow still related to and valuable for what for the task and that's why i think it's not a task switch mm. and unless you think that reading is about ocular scanning and and that's very, very narrow so i think there are many kinds of breaks of course um but i think we're i mean I'm, i was just fascinating that no no one in the whole literature and reading has actually studied that except treating it as like uh dysfunctional in some sense to to the case but i can't tell you exactly that because we haven't studied that systematically uh yet Okay, so yeah. I mean, it is. It's it, it bespeaks a, a kind of a very unitary notion of um, of mental life, really. That, as you said right at the start, there's just this one train of thought that can either be derailed or not. Whereas the reality is, of course, it's we're more like an orchestra. You know, there's there's multiple 
um, things happening at different rhythms um, yeah. or different tempos and maybe in the same rhythm. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes the, the string section um, takes the lead and sometimes it's percussion and sometimes it's wind. Um, so I, I guess yeah, being able to tell the difference of when, when the symphony has gone awry or um, when it's just, we've just changed our emphasis yeah. is a, a, a vital thing. So. Uh, yeah. The, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's kind of a horrific notion, the idea that because a person has, a, a, particularly someone who's learning has become enthusiastic about the story, that somehow they're now, you know, that's bad reading, yeah, is you exactly. can imagine the uh, the impacts of it. But yeah. I guess the, I mean, in, in a way that leads me to then one of your more later comments um, about the way in which that kind of exploration happens then. Uh, and you noted the, or you used the phrase messiness n- numerous times. Um, I'm very pro mess. I, um, I again, I, th- I think it's a very yeah. um, important concept. You know, positive, positive messiness. Um, but in particular, you talked about making information, and there was a reference to Gibson on the slide. But of course, the the idea of making ecological information is, I would imagine, a um, uh, a potentially controversial one, you know, I can imagine a, a bunch of ecological psychologists being triggered by it. Uh, uh, but I would love to hear you say more about it, because I think there's a, I mean, there's an interesting distinction that Gibson makes that that um, I, I don't know enough about, which is between exploratory and performative action. And, you know, when you're the exploratory action, you're literally going, well, all this texture of the world that I never use, mm. what can I do with it? Mm. Um, so could I, I get you actually just ask you to maybe if there's anything you would like to say more about that, just that notion of making information. Is it ecological information that you have in mind there or is it, is no, it more? I don't think so, at least. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not an expert expert. Uh, I, I mean, I read, I read the whole book and I think it's fascinating, but I actually had the reference to Gibson with, we pick up information. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if you still see the slide, but I just got back to it here, yeah. yeah. So um, I think that's completely, uh, you know, fair to say. I think they will all agree with that, the ecological psychologists, that we pick up, I mean, information is there, right? And we just pick up information because we've learned to, uh, we have been trained in identifying uh, a world of value. So when we, um, when we grab a book, it's because we have learned to grab a book in a particular way and read that and so on. So that's uh, the book affords reading because we've learned that. So that's why we pick up information. I think though, that that's extremely, fa- I mean, there are, how, how would that account for change or creativity? I mean, that's only social normativity in a sense. And here people will probably jump on me for saying that, but I think that's, you know, somehow, uh, a limitation just to say that we pick up information and it's there already. We create things all the time. I mean, very often it's like, I can also go around look in my world without having any kind of understanding or interpretation. I don't need that necessarily all the time. I mean, I can suddenly look at something and make that valuable because I'm bored or because I suddenly, I mean, that's the girl with the cup here. Oh, suddenly you just do something and then you make that meaningful but it isn't in advance i mean an arm doesn't afford having a cup standing on it as such i mean that's something that you can make it do so i think that you know to account for the playfulness the the homo ludens that's exactly that we we are not just you know efficient and rational and you know picking up the right information we are also learning ways ourselves by chance by but because we have imagination and creativity so we suddenly come to i mean then everything is information and then it's a completely useless concept, right? If, it's, if that's the case. So by picking up information mean, has to mean that, that there's something that uh, gives us something uh, already. And very often I think we play with things without meaning. There's no meaning there. It's, it's not something we pick up, it's just there. I mean, the world is there and sometimes we can make it meaningful uh, and then it can become meaningless again. So I think it was just to play with the creativity aspect because we haven't really, and I think also that's kind of what biases the more functional analysis that we often do because we look at, do they pick up the right information? Oh, here they didn't understand. That's why we can assess reading or say, and say, well, now you are, you are not focusing. Now you're not doing that because you're not picking up the information that you're supposed to do or within that kind of domain. 
but we do all kinds of you know things people are just like doing so many many weird things we observe and and oh that's the mess right and that's part of the story too i think and it has nothing to do with understanding or meaning necessarily it's just like we are just there and we are just exploiting the thereness somehow i think um, that's lovely, and in fact, a, a lovely note on which to finish. I just see we're um, we're very much on the hour, so I don't yeah. want to keep you. Um, but I want to say thank you very much for um, presenting with us, and um, I really enjoyed it and really appreciate it. And um, and, and thanks for coming on. And um, we will we'll see for those um, viewing. We will we'll see you hopefully next month for the the March Enso seminar. Thank you. Now, and then that's that's us out. We are.